Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 170 an interview with Dr. Amy Leichhardt. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Flute 360 podcast interview. I am so excited that you are here today, and I just want to direct your attention to the fact that this talk is also being recorded via video. So I know that this is a new element for us Flute 360 listeners, and I want to bring that to your attention, especially for this series. Not only will you get to see myself and Dr. Amy Leichhardt in action, but it is so important to this, you know, notion of this health series. There's a skeleton behind Dr. Amy Leichhardt, and we're going to be talking about the body and movement, and what better way to, you know, illustrate some of these concepts through the visual element. So go over to YouTube and check out the Flute360's YouTube channel for the video component. Without further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Amy Leichhardt, for being here, and I cannot wait to dive into this subject with you today. Well, Heidi, thank you so much for having me, and I really look forward to our talk. And uh, just to give a little background about me, my first degree was in music education. And then I went and lived in the African bush for a year and taught English in what is now called the Kingdom of Eswatini, Africa, which is surrounded by South Africa on three sides. Then I came back and entered a master's degree program at Ohio State and did my master's and doctorate at Ohio State. And then I also completed Alexander Technique certification at the Alexander Training Institute of San Francisco. And I completed body mapping licensure with Barbara Conable back in 1998. And so I feel like I'm one of those really, really fortunate people who actually takes every degree that I ever got and I get to do it all. So my job in the Oakland Symphony I get to perform on a regular basis, both as their piccoloist and as a chamber musician. And for the last 17 years, I've taught for their education program. So I mentor in the Oakland Unified School District. Uh, Every fall, I usually start a huge number of flute players. Then I'm the director of training for the Association for Body Mapping Education. So over the years, I've mentored numerous professional musicians in their professional development to teach the course that that Barbara started, Barbara Conable started called What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body. And so it's for me, I feel like I'm one of those really, really fortunate people who on a regular basis I decidedly do not get bored. Everything that I do in terms of body mapping and Alexander technique, I think helps me grow as a musician and a performer. And then what I do as a musician and a performer, I think informs the teaching that I do in the realm of musicians wellness. Oh, amazing. (laughs) Thank you for that background. Yeah. What was it like working with Barbara? So she's a tour de force and she, I guess the biggest thing I studied with her. So I was introduced to the Alexander technique through William Conable at the Ohio state university. And I took a winter workshop with her and then started studying privately with her after I was in a car accident. And I think of her as a huge cheerleader. Okay. So for me, most of my lessons with her were at the flute with three way mirrors, where, because her studio had mirrors on, on three sides, and I would videotape my lessons. And for me, 
it was one of those instances where she really helped me figure out how I was moving and how it was impacting what I wanted to do musically. Mm. I think of one and, you know, we flute players tend to be stressed out type A personalities. <laughs> no, I rem- not, a, not yeah. us at all. <laughs> and I, I do remember when I was working, I do, I remember this very clearly, actually, I was working on the Lieberman flute sonata and had also been prone to having jaw pain as a jaw clencher. And I'm also a pianist, so tendonitis in both my forearms as a pianist. Mm. And I remember working on the Lieberman Sonata and going and playing it for her. And she was like, Amy, you have to take the sound out of this, right? And this is the second movement, which you all know, and super fast and high and technically challenging. And she just had me turn my head joint so that I was blowing air into the back of the head joint. And she had me take the sound element out of it. And she was like, do you see how you're moving your fingers? Like, is that really efficient? Is that really helping you fulfill your musical ideas? And she also helped me realize that I would lose self-awareness really quickly whenever I was playing something technically challenging. So that work with her really, really helped me change how I was practicing. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were in a car accident. I'm so mm-hmm. sorry to hear that. Was that situation and that event one of the, I don't know, driving forces into you studying within this field? It actually, it actually, well, I first started studying Alexander right when I showed up at Ohio State University because I was I was a jaw clencher and Catherine Boris Jones said, you know, hey, this class is here, go take it. And so I took William Conable's class, I think three times while I was a master's student and another three times while I was a doctoral student. And Concurrently, I took Kathy taught a performance enhancement class with a sports psychologist named Neil Newman. So the same time I was studying Alexander Technique, I was doing a lot of the James Lair, Mihai Chicks at Mihai's Flow, um, Barry Green's books, um, just a lot of the, the, the mental toughness type stuff. But when I got, I was rear-ended and just had a lot of neck pain. And I think it was Kathy again that said, you know, you should go take private lessons with Barbara Conable. Mm. And actually my husband and I t- took joint lessons with her because he was sitting in a desk all the time and was having (laughs) low back pain. So the two of us would go and take lessons together and then monitor one another at home and (laughs) gently say, Hey, notice what you're doing. Hey, notice what you're doing. So that was really helpful to have um, someone to share that experience with. And then that was around the time she was formulating the, what every musician needs to know about the body class. And so I felt like myself, along with Lee Pearson and David Neesmith and Bridget Jankowski, they're, David's a horn player, Bridget's a pianist, um, Roberta Gary, an organist at um, Cincinnati Conservatory. A lot of us were, were studying with Barbara when she started putting the What Every Musician Needs to Body, What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body class together. Mm. Did you take that class initially in the early stages with Lee Pearson? No, I took it in the early stages with Barbara Conable when she okay. was formulating the class. Okay. I guess my yeah. question, I misspoke. I guess my question was, was Lee Pearson in the class with you and Barbara? Um, About a year or two later. Yes, she was. Okay. Oh, yeah, cool. about a, No, yeah, she was there at the same time. I think we ended up. I think she finished her training about a year after I finished my training. Okay. 
or oh. within within six to eight months. Sure. Yeah, we were all she our doctorate somewhat overlapped at Ohio State. I think I finished in 1999 and I don't quite remember when she finished her doctorate there. <laughs> oh, cool. What a small world. I yeah, love no, that. We were all there. We were all there studying and learning and growing with each other. Oh, neat. Very cool. So in the beginning, when you're talking about being certified um, in the realm of body mapping and the Alexander technique, since we are talking about those two topics today, I would like to lay out a foundation. Um, can you share with the listeners what is body mapping and what is the Alexander technique? Sure. So body mapping is your mental conception in your mind of your structure, your function, and your size. And so it's all about learning the relationships between your bones and your muscles and how you organize them for movement. And so when Barbara created the course, What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body, she was hoping then musicians could teach other musicians about these relationships and hopefully lower the incidence of injury. I, I do believe she was thinking of the course as preventative medicine. Okay. Well, maybe not medicine, but pre preventative information okay. that could help people think about how they were using their bodies to make music and hopefully use their bodies in such a way that they wouldn't injure themselves playing a musical instrument. Okay. So the Alexander technique, it's a technique that was created by FM Alexander and it helps you become more self-aware, um, aware of yourself, aware of your space and the relationship between yourself and the space. It's, you know, I, I like to think of it as a really simple and practical technique for me. I have a coin and on one side is the body mapping and mm. on the other side is the Alexander technique because I've, I'm now approaching year 29 of studying them both. And so I like to think that the two of them together help me have a greater kinesthetic sensitivity, more awareness of my movement. And in particular, how taking a musical intention. And that's one of the things that during the pandemic, I've been thinking about a lot because I think a lot of times musicians end up in a fight, flight, freeze pattern when they're practicing because they're, they really don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, they, they haven't thought through enough, like, well, how do I want to play this? They may not know, and but they have to pick something. And so, you know, the way I, I like to talk about it is, okay, pick the smallest unit where you can feel like you can organize your whole self and play it and play it comfortably, hmm. expressively, musically, but by not putting isolated gripping or over efforting in your body. So for me, it's, it's all about figuring out the appropriate amount of work that you're going to do physically to give yourself the musical result that you want. And if you know what you want musically, then it becomes easier to organize yourself physically and that takes time and that's the practice process and that's mm. you know the sorting out and, and figuring it out and videotaping and audio taping and getting comfortable with watching yourself and working with someone so that you know you can learn how to have eyes to watch yourself and and that to mm. me is the process Oh, I, I hope love I that. I hope I explained that all. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. Oh, you crossed every T and dotted every I. I loved every second of it. <laughs> okay. Go, 
going back to this, you know, um, idea of the coin, right? On the one side of the coin, you, you have the body mapping and the other side you have Alexander Technique. Um, I am not an expert in any means, um, but I would assume that there are a lot of similarities between the two techniques, not to, I, not to put you on the spot. And I think that this is a meaty question, but are there any notable differences of the two techniques that you would like to mention? So the, the main, and this is interesting, this is very interesting because of the pandemic. So originally, primarily the Alexander technique has been taught in a one-on-one -on -one situation with a teacher who actually puts their hands on you and guides you physically to easier relationships physically. Okay. And uses their hands to bring you into greater self-awareness. And with the Alexander technique, there can be a table work component to it. With body mapping, you're purely working with the thinking and using anatomy and anatomical images and helping students. You know, one of the common things that we teach is, you know, how the skull balances on top of the spine <laughs> and suddenly a spine <laughs> appears, how, how the spine is delivering weight um, into the pelvis and the legs and how the major joint, how major joint mobility works with, within the body and, you know, how the, the ribs and the arms are supported by the spine and how the pelvis interacts with the legs and how your hip joints, knee joints and ankle joints support your pelvis and your spine and how your spine. Support. And so it's this whole body understanding that can take some time to figure out. I'm still making discoveries. It's, it's part of the reason I love teaching this information is I'm always learning something new. The learning never ends. Hmm. We're complicated people. And, you know, it's like, okay, what's, where's my curiosity going to take me today? Hmm. And usually when people get into trouble, it's because something needs to change. And if you don't want to become aware of what you're doing and how it may need to change, then this, you know, this yeah. technique isn't going to help you. <laughs> so if you're, if you're so married to like the way it's always been done, then, then both body mapping and Alexander technique can challenge your thinking a little bit. But if you're kind of open to what the possibilities are and you know like for me it's like how moving can I make this performance how musical can I make this performance and what are the movements that are going to get me to do it yeah fair no <laughs> yeah I love that word curiosity um we need to be curious you know just in life in general kind of like a young child and how they experience the world, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Curious in the practice room, curious like, oh, if I were to do this or that, or, you know, how would that affect the sound? And then I, I will say that then when you're in the performing arena, you let that all go. I see. And yep. performance becomes performance and you don't second guess yourself. Sure. That gets that that can get you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that gets you into the over analysis paralysis and like ah, it's not doing, you know. <clears throat> so when you walk on stage, it's like I've done the work and now I'm performing. And I hugely advocate practicing performing. So somebody that I've coached with over the years is Burton Kaplan, who's written the book Practicing for Artistic Success. He's a string player. And in his book, he talks about um, the technique of the first try, where you set up a video camera, you set up a time in your in your date book to say, okay, I'm turning the camera on and I'm performing. And then you go and you bow 
and you perform and you don't stop and you do it. And then you wait a little bit Mm. and then you watch it twice. Mm. Once where you're taking notes for how you're going to improve your next practice session and the spots that need your attention that aren't quite getting the flow that you want or the you're not quite feeling the emotional impact of the character that you think you're giving in the music. Mm. That's so you're you're listening to it once as the performer and then you're listening to it once as an audience member. I always tell my students listen to it as if grandma was listening. <laughs> And, you know, congratulate yourself for what you're actually doing well. I mean, musical Mm -hmm. performance is ephemeral. It disappears right after we do it, except except now with all this recording. Right. (laughs) And, and, you know, it, there's always, you know, it's a continuum. It's not a deadline. It's decidedly Mm. a continuum. I love that. And I think that's one of the things, you know, when we're in school, we often only perform things maybe once or twice. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the professional realm, you realize we're performing things over and over and over and over again, and they only get better and easier and more fluid and more free Mm -hmm. and that's exciting to me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I'm so glad you brought up the fact of practicing performing. I was actually going to ask you, do you practice performing? Because that is something that I advocate too, because, you know, we practice, you know, chunking this section, this section. And then sometimes I see my students go on stage and without practicing the actual performance, they're like, you know, a deer in headlights, like, oh my gosh, like what going from top to bottom. (laughs) It's like, yeah, this is a new experience. We need to like bring that in the practice room and actually practice that performance. So that way you're comfortable when you actually go and do it. Right. Yeah. I do practice performing. And if I, if I have a program that I'm taking on tour, I will either offer a house concert at, well, this is pre-pandemic. I would you know, I would do a house concert at my house for, for an audience and play what I was taking on tour or do Burton's technique of, you know, first tries where, you know, a week or two before I'm leaving to, to, to go tour something, I will record myself every day and watch it. And, and there's two things that happen as you record every day and then watch back you get used to the performing. You've seen yourself do this program <laughs> numerous times. There's not much anybody out in the audience can tell you that you don't already know. Mm. So I think the anxiety that you know some people experience when they perform goes, goes down because you've kind of sensitized yourself to watching yourself for several yeah. days before <laughs> you go to do it. And, and I know with, I have done that with students before their, you know, end of semester juries, you know, their last two, three lessons. I'm like, okay, you only have three lessons left jury program. Now mm-hmm. you know, we're recording it mm-hmm. and then having them journal and watch it back and say how they thought it went. And, you know, and then they have a few weeks to fix it. Yeah. And that's the other beauty, I think, of Zoom this year is a lot of students did just record their lessons and then watch them back. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of I did have a lot of people sending me videos where they because the video would sound the recording equipment for the video is better than the recording equipment for Zoom. Mm. So to actually hear what they were sounding like they would record themselves and then we would use the lesson time to talk about practice strategies for fixing everything that needed fixed. So. Oh, smart. Yeah. I love that. So since you've been in the field for 29 years, um, throughout this time, 
what, you know, and studying about health and wellness, what is the number one element about the body that you wish more musicians knew about? Oh, um, if you start losing awareness of yourself while practicing, just stop. Okay. Um, there's a threshold exercise that I've taught in many, many classes that I've done online this year, where you just take a moment to ask yourself how you're feeling, how are you? And then to bring yourself back to all of your senses, mm. you become omnisensorial. Mm. And then just cue in on something in the room that you love. And so during the pandemic, for me, it was my fuzzy slippers. <laughs> But just, you know, how am I? Am I aware of myself? Am I aware mm. of my space? Mm. Is there something in this room that I love? Yes. All right. I'm cued in again. And then because if if you lose awareness of self, and I will, I'll freely admit this. When I started studying with Barbara, she asked me this question, how long I could be self-aware while practicing. Hmm. And I was like, oh. I don't know, an hour. And then I set a timer and it hit me like, <laughs> I don't, you know, those yeah. Roadrunner cartoons where the weight squashes. The <laughs> I realized I could only stay aware of myself for like six to 10 seconds. <laughs> and so for the last 29 years, I've been working on being aware of myself while practicing. And I, I will say now I still, you know, I'll set a timer on my watch for, you know, 10 minutes or something okay. like that. And I'll have it vibrate and I'll be like, Hey, am I still in the picture here? And if I can say yes, then I keep practicing. But if I'm like, mm, not quite, then I might, you know, go lie on the floor, roll around with the physio ball, do some whole body stretching. Um, sip a cup of tea and then, and then, you know, reconfigure and think about, okay, if I lost my self-awareness so quickly, do I really know what I, I want with this piece of music? And then, you know, maybe it's going and listening to a recording of it or taking a look at the score and seeing how the meter and the rhythm you know, work with one another. And, and I do some practicing away from the instrument mm. to get my thinking a little bit more clear rather than to be like, I got to learn these notes and rhythms. <laughs> and, and you're just like pounding it out. Yeah. Um, it all, to me, it always just helps to take a step back and, and then the body stays healthier. Mm. I think the other component that for me because of my own medical history of having a cesarean section and different things, you know, different sporting things that I've done where I've injured myself, I do actually work out, you know, once a week with a personal trainer who is mm -hmm. trained in proprioceptive movement, who watches me like a hawk and, you know, actually works, you know, I'm getting ready to, to do some hiking. And so we've been doing a lot of you know, foot and ankle and hip joint stuff hmm. so that as I go out and hike for, for hours and hours that I feel like my legs have the stability and the flexibility to keep me from falling. Mm. I love that. And, you know, especially what I love hearing is, you know, somebody, um, as wise and as somebody who is an expert in this field, who has been doing this for almost 30 years for you just to say, I'm still learning, you know, life mm -hmm. is still showing me things and I'm, I'm not done yet. I'm, I'm continually growing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a good reminder for me. Yeah. I'm a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> you can ask my family. I'm just like, we're, I mean, I think we're all works in progress, but okay. I'm a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So um, if you don't mind, you know, diving into maybe some exercises, anything that would help the musician in their practice session to help with prevention of injury or any exercises to help with the awareness, I think that would be great. Great. So one of my favorite 
<laughs> things that I've done to keep me co- sort of cool, calm, and collected through the pandemic is one of the books that I've read over the pandemic is James Nestor's Breath. Um, mm. I forget the subtitle of it, but I think James Nestor Breath will get you there. Okay. And one of the things he talks about in there is comes from yogic traditions, which is alternate nostril breathing. And I don't know if you've ever done any alternate nostril breathing, mm-hmm. but it will calm you down faster than anything. One of the programs that uh, Jim Brody who's the director of the Musicians Wellness Center at CU Boulder. He and I taught for several weeks at a performing arts high school in Maryland throughout the pandemic. And we had a lot of stressed out performing arts students. And Mm. so one of the things that they felt was really helpful was alternate nostril breathing. And so I'm going to demo it and I'll do the four count with one hand and then I'll show you what I'm doing. So I'm (laughs) I'm closing one nostril with my thumb, and then I'm gonna inhale through the other nostril for a count of four. And then I'm gonna switch. And then I'm gonna inhale on that side. So I'm basically going inhale, exhale through the other nostril, inhale through that same nostril, then exhale through the other nostril. And there you can find a lot of variation on this, but I find that it's a way that you can either, and you can read about it, you can either energize yourself or calm yourself really quickly through just doing some alternate nostril breathing. So that's thing number one I'm gonna offer. Thing number number two I'm going to offer is just getting a a good sense of your skull and sort of palpating your whole skull. And I'm sitting down right now. So I'm thinking about my sitting bones on the chair and that I've got a nice, my, my torso is over my sitting bones on the chair and my legs feel nice and easy. And I'm just thinking about the ease and mobility of my skull. I'm taking my fingers just right up under my earlobes, or you can put them in your ears, but my AirPods are in there, so I don't wanna do that. (laughs) And like if our fingers could touch, it would be just above and behind our uvulas. So the uvulas, you know, the end of your soft palate, it's that little thing that hangs down in the back of your throat. And if you just think above and behind your uvula, again, you may notice that that might bring some breath in and you're just thinking about a little bit of ease there. And from there, we're gonna just, um, because flute players tend to, you know, Mm. do this Mm -hmm. so much, we're just gonna think, And you may not even be able to see me doing this, but I'm just thinking of of a little subtle back. And then a little subtle side. Hmm. Very subtle. And then back. Hmm. And you shouldn't feel any stretch. It should feel very, very subtle. And then side. And then, oops. There goes the air pot. <laughs> We're going to take that and just very gently tilt where it feels like your cervical spine is gently opening on mm. one side. And you're going to do that for like, I don't know, four or five times. Not a huge motion, not mm. the typical, you know, shoulder to ear thing okay. that can be kind of big. This is just very, very subtle. And then to the other side, very, very subtle. And notice 
how one side may feel different than the other side. Hmm. And then just seeing, you know, how does this head, neck, hmm. you know, yeah. spine relationship up the front of your whole spine, how do, hmm. you know, what do you notice? if anything. And for me, that usually gives me, it's a really quick, easy way to feel like my, my skull spine relationship is, is freer. Mm. Then another one that I love doing with flute players, and <laughs> there's a few flute players out there in the world who may feel like I'm telling on them in this. I always teach this to the youth orchestras that I mentor. Mm. And now I always remember to tell them to do it backstage because I have some kids that did it on stage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so basically we're going to take our fingers and we're just going to gently massage on either side of our skull up in our hair. And go ahead and open and close your lower jaw, the, the mandible, uh -huh. and feel those muscles under, your, under the heel of your hand moving. Huh. You might want to bring them a little further uh -huh. forward. Forward, okay. So just like, like, you know, right here up on the side of your, just okay. above your ears. Okay. And then. Yeah. So that's thing, that's your temporalis muscle up here. And it's just kind of jiggling it around and loosening it up a little bit. So okay. now we're going to take our knuckles and we're going to go from this kind of ear flap. Okay along the cheekbone and into our nose. So we're just gonna kind of take our knuckles and you might find a tender spot there and you just kind of give it a little love and then kind of bring it in. Oh. So imagine a high school flute section on stage in a youth orchestra <laughs> doing this. It gets yeah. even better. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're going to take your like index and middle fingers and gently just palpate up under your jaw. And then we're going to slowly retract our, take our, stick our tongues out and then very, 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 very slowly let it ooze back into our mouths. Mm. So. You can do that a couple of times and then just let the tongue feel like it's released on the bottom of your mouth. Huh. And so the students were playing Rimsky Korsakov's Russian Easter Overture. Mm. And so I was advocating this before they have to go. <laughs> so there they are all on stage. <laughs> Fluffing up their hair, hair. And sticking out their tongue. <laughs> their tongue. And I'm in the I'm in the audience going, oh, I love that they're listening to me. I am so touched. And I hope nobody's videoing. <laughs> of course, now I'm doing it on a podcast. Yeah. That's amazing. Although if it was being video recorded, you know, in the concert, that opens up a great opportunity for discussion. It's true. It's true. Yeah. So how does your tongue and jaw feel after doing that? Yes. I didn't realize before the exercise that there was actually some tension on the right side of my jaw. And then going through it, I felt like it kind of evened out a little bit more with the left side. Right. And so to me, that's really useful because sometimes people, um, I know for me, sometimes I play a little off to the side and one side will feel a little tighter than the other side and my mouth is a little asymmetrical. So, uh -huh. um, 
that to me always like, okay, okay. Yeah. And so it's helped me tremendously uh, with any sort of jaw or tongue tension. That is interesting because I do play off to the side too. My aperture is a little bit more to the left. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if if there is any other flutist out there who does play, you know, not completely centered, how that jaw alignment could be um, off a little bit if one side is being not favored, but one side is being utilized more so than the other side. Right. And so I would say most, I mean, we're all pretty, I hate to say it, asymmetrical. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody has the same lip shape. And so this for me is just a way of like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Checking in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> freeing it up. And yeah, it can keep you, for me, it's, it's one of those useful things <laughs> where with articulation, you build, I think you build up your endurance over time. And so, you know, if, if you're needing to play something that requires a lot of double tonguing, that's the whole reason we do double tonguing exercises, but you want to, you don't try to play the whole page when you start, you, right. you, you do have to figure out how to practice in such a way where yeah. you're just doing small portions and then, and then you're increasing, basically you're increasing your load. It's sort of like you wouldn't go to the gym and start with the hardest workout, but for some reason, <laughs> flute players, I just injured myself. Huh. <laughs> I wonder so, why. So, I mean, I do, you do yeah. have to, you do have to approach it, I think, mm. like an athlete. Okay. Yeah. Five pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds. <laughs> or maybe one pound, <laughs> three pounds, five pounds, you know, and, and it's interesting to me because my trainer almost never has me do weights for for like my bicep tricep he has me do stuff that's going to require my legs to be engaged my pelvis to be engaged hmm. my torso to be working and my arms are kind of along for the ride and i that that could change over time but he, you know, he, he decidedly is like, no, you have a propensity to overwork your triceps when you play the flute, oh. you know, so we're not, <laughs> I see, no, we're not going to do tricep kickbacks. You're already too, like, this is already <laughs> over engaged. No, you don't need to do that. So huh. that's what I mean when you have to find someone that, that really gears a workout to what it is you do sure no oh, yeah that makes sense everything's connected so if there is a listener listening to this discussion today and they are going through a season of injury what advice would you give to them to put their team together and you know there's many wonderful body mapping and alexander technique teachers out there i also have to give a shout out to my colleagues that teach feldenkrais which i also mm -hmm. think is wonderful and these are those somatic methods that that help you think about how you're moving and mm -hmm. the movement choices that you're making mm -hmm. i do think it's important to have a good relationship with a medical provider. I do know of people in my past who, you know, had bone metastases from cancer, but they thought they were misusing themselves. And so it's important to have a medical provider that knows you and knows your medical history. And, but for people to also be their own best self advocate, because I know the medical community can, you know, they can be like, Oh, just go rest for a while. And it's like, well, 
you might not be able to rest. You might need to make your living. <laughs> and so, you know, find, find the providers and the practitioners that can help you return to play, that can help you come up with a plan, that can help you return to play physically healthy, mentally healthy, and and get you doing what you want to do. Hmm. Yes, thank you for that. So speaking of injury, this is just my perspective, but I think and I feel like this topic within the music community is a little taboo, you know, and it's kind of hush hush to talk about it. Why do you think that is? And how can we maybe remove this toxicity from our industry? So I think, you know, people have not wanted to talk about it because I think they feel like it will eliminate them from the work that they want. But when you look at these surveys that that keep coming out over and over again, I think I I would like to say I feel like the taboo is changing just because there's so many people out there that have experienced injury either from playing their musical instrument or from just injuring themselves doing something else. Sure. Um, And we want to have active full lives. And so I think, you know, people need to talk about it. We also though, we need to talk about how people tend to push, 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 push themselves. And a lot of musicians, when they're doing the work, like performing and it's, it's rigorous. And so I think people need to understand when they need to rest and recover and when they, and how they need to organize their practicing based on whatever repertoire they're working on professionally or for the love of it or for whatever you might have a someone who who might work a different job and then because they want to practice they might overdo it on the weekends Mm -hmm. rather than just saying okay play your instrument 10 or 15 minutes twice a day during the week and then maybe do a longer session on the weekend but don't don't do the don't play all week and then play for hours on the weekend that that does become a recipe I think for injuring oneself and and I know I think college professors will attest that many students don't practice as much as they should over the summer and then they come back and then the Mm. program starts and like two three weeks into the semester yeah And so it's continually reinforcing for the students that playing a musical instrument is like working out. (laughs) You have to build it up and you need, you know, you need the the tone work and the, the technical work and the etude work that helps bridge to your repertoire and your excerpt work. And you need to think about how you're doing it all and include yourself in the equation so that you don't injure yourself. I think people also need to pay attention to how they're using their computers, how they're using their devices. Pandemic started, I was in front of the Zoom screen all day teaching body mapping and Alexander technique. And guess who was making an appointment with her chiropractor because her back was hurting. (laughs) And he's like, how much are you sitting? (laughs) Oh, yeah. More than I'm used to. Have you been working out? Uh, (laughs) No, I'm depressed because the pandemic is happening and everything blew up. (laughs) So it was, you know, Okay. So then, then he gave me the challenge. All right. For every hour you're sitting in front of a zoom, you're going to do 10 backwards lunges to make, and, and nice. That did it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's important to be aware of those activities outside of the practice room. 
you know, typing, you know, emails. Oh my goodness, as a teacher, a professor, uh, you know, all of us, that's our world is just being bombarded with a lot of emails sometimes and just noticing those activities, like what you're saying, like the devices and the keyboards and being in front of the screen, it all can add up if we're not careful and aware of how we're uh, using and treating our bodies. So that, that, I mean, that comes back to when you asked me the question, um, like, what was the one thing? I'm like, just mm. be aware yeah. of yourself and, yeah. and, and be whole, be a whole being. Um, don't just be lips and hands or. Um, yeah, fair. Well, as we're wrapping up this wonderful conversation, do you have any classes or events that are coming up in your calendar? So I was thinking about this and I have said, you know, I'm, I have, by the time this airs, several things will be over. So one that I can say is that in October, my duo partner, Rena Urso and I, we play in the Alcyon Ensemble together. We're going to be teaching a class in October at Flute World San Francisco mm. <laughs> on October 16th, Saturday, October 16th. She and I, throughout the pandemic, have been teaching a class called Crafting the Beautiful Etude, which combines body mapping and Alexander technique to the practicing of Anderson Etudes and mining for melody and how to practice them without injuring yourself and figuring out out ways to see what these etudes can teach you and, and learning that they can really support other things in your playing. And so we have that coming up in October. A lot of the other classes I'm teaching are for people that are training to teach body mapping. And so those are for people that are training to teach body mapping. But as always, I'm open and available. People just email me and if if I have the time, I, you know, schedule people in for a consult or for a lesson whenever we can find a mutually convenient time to do so. Nice. Uh, do you mind sharing your email address? Not at all. It's just amy at amylikar.com. You can go to my website, amylikar.com. And I, I'm trying to be better about keeping it updated. And this podcast will encourage me to post that this is coming up on it. And I'm working on being better at getting out regular newsletters. And so just, you know, you can subscribe to my newsletter on my website and things should be posted up there. I do post things on Instagram and Facebook as well. So follow me. Yay. <laughs> And I will um, put all of your links in the show notes below. So if you're a listener listening to this and you want easy access, just scroll on down and you can just click away with ease. So there's that. Well, Amy, in the last segment of the show, I like to do a fun little portion called picks. You can pick anything under the sun. It could be your favorite book, TV show, etc. What is your pick today for the listeners? My pick today for the listeners is I've become addicted to Burmese tea leaf salad. Mm. <laughs> so I live around the corner from a Burmese restaurant and I've been eating way too much tea leaf salad. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> if you don't know what tea leaf salad is, check it out. You can buy the ingredients <laughs> for it on Amazon and have them sent and then you can put the stuff on your salad but yeah I have never <laughs> heard of tea leaf salad so google Burmese tea leaf salad yeah I live around I live maybe a five to six minute walk away from a restaurant here in the Bay Area called Burma Superstar and you can ask my husband tea leaf <laughs> salad again <laughs> Yes, tea leaf salad again. So the dressing is made out of fermented tea leaves and it's got nuts and sesame seeds and dried lentils and um, uh, dried garlic and it's very flavorful and it's crunchy and you can put salad and 
peppers and whatever you want in the salad. And then you can put all these crunchy bits and the, the dressing is really delicious. <laughs> oh my goodness. It does sound <laughs> yummy. <laughs> I can't wait to check that out. And speaking of tea, my tea or my pick for today is tea as well, but the tea you drink. I am a huge fan lately of Tazo's Wild Sweet Orange Tea, and it kind of surprises me because I'm not typically a citrusy type of gal, but this tea is like phenomenal. So you can get it at Sprouts or Target, easy to find, and it's uh, herbal too. So it's good for me. I love that tea. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, I do love that tea. <laughs> See, I don't lie. <laughs> no, it's you don't really lie. good. <laughs> it's really good. And, and yeah. in fact, I often like to drink it for dessert because it's so, yeah. it's, 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 it's just a really nice after dinner tea, I think, <laughs> or a mid afternoon tea. I, it's just, it's a really good tea. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I especially like it because it's herbal and this girl does not need more caffeine because I'm already like <laughs> high energy. So herbal tea is is best for me. Oh, uh, shoot. <laughs> well, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. I've had so much fun talking with you during this time. And thank you for asking me. Oh my goodness. The pleasure is all mine. And I need to thank you. Thank you for carving out time for us. And thank you for just, you know, giving us your expertise and knowledge in this arena and just flooding our earbuds with such amazing information. And we so appreciate you. Oh, well, thank you. We'll have a mutual love fest here. <laughs> I think what I think what you're doing is absolutely terrific. So thank you Aww. for doing it. Oh, thank you, Amy. The School of Music at Texas Tech University prepares professional musicians, educators, and industry leaders to take control of their futures. The people, the program, and the power of a top-tier university differentiate our TTU School of Music students. We ensure that TTU faculty, students, and alumni have three keys. They engage successfully as scholars and performers. They continue to expand their career for years to come with bold strategy and experience. And they serve impeccably as leaders who understand the process, the peak performance skills, and people value that makes TTU's School of Music and Lubbock, Texas a destination of choice. People are at the heart of our institution. This commitment ensures that each student experiences major ensembles, band, choir, jazz, orchestra, and opera, chamber music, stellar academics, as well as individual attention in private lessons. The vernacular music program with tango orchestra, mariachi band, Baltic and Celtic ensembles, medieval band, and research forums differentiates the TTU program by being an offer for both undergraduate and graduate students. Performance facilities include the 541-seat Hemley Recital Hall, which houses an 84-rank Holt Camp organ consisting of 4,469 pipes. Home to the largest instrument collection in West Texas, the School of Music provides Fazioli and Steinway concert grand pianos, a Kingston French double harpsichord, a Martin harpsichord, and we are fortunate to have a 36-bell carillon. The School of Music is an accredited member of the National Association of Schools of Music and offers bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in music and music education. Let's talk about flute. 